All right, so let's jump into just very briefly the learning objectives for the panel today. Um, we're going to talk about the current cost accounting tools that are on the market. Uh, many of you might be familiar with some of those. Um, talk about why executives uh, like Robin Magdalia have decided to invest in advanced activity-based costing, um, and then how that plays into uh, the changing payment models uh, towards more value-based care. Um, so with that, we're just going to jump right into it. Really excited to be here today um, with some people that I've worked with for a number of years. Um, and so just to get us kicked off, I was going to start with you, Rob. Um, can you just briefly share uh, UPMC's approach to costing, both historically and, and what led to where you are today? Sure. So um, our journey, I, um, I've been with UPMC for 15 years. I arrived in 2004. And uh, after a few years, our, the chair of our finance committee, who came from industry, said, boy, you guys really need a cost accounting system. And I said, we do. Let me do some other things first, integration, growth. Um, so it took a while for us to get to his request, but um, we really didn't have a cost accounting system. And, and I'd tell you that we, like many in the industry, were victims of our own success in a way, right? We're, we're profitable, the margins are okay, uh, we're in a fee-for-service environment, so actually doing more, it's cost plus. The more you do, the more cost you have, the more revenue and the more margin that you have. And so, uh, but we were making a transition away from that, a much more competitive marketplace, and a growing health plan. So we became more and more moving from fee-for-service to being capitated with our own health plan. So cost became very, very important. So we really did not have a cost accounting system at all. We had some pockets of what you know, many of you call decision support. And we had a nursing productivity tool, which was based on hours. But none of them were at a level of, of um, reliability, of clarity, of accuracy that could earn the trust of the physicians, let alone allow us to compare, you know, we're up now up to 40 hospitals and I think nearly everyone has a different charge master. So certainly a ratio of cost to charges wouldn't work. So it's very hard to do any kind of service line analytics or any kind of um, comparison of hospital to hospital with the system that we had. And that led us to this journey to develop and then partner with Health Catalyst on an activity-based costing system. And that's, that's kind of where we are now and we're, we're on really a great journey. Thanks. And then Migdalia, you, you guys did have an existing system. Right. So Michigan has um, actually had cost, we've had costing for about a little bit over 30 years. We've always leveraged a vendor-based platform, um, but we've always used also traditional costing approaches. So um, relative value units and um, cost to charge. We then in 2016 started to re-explore the um, platform that we had in place as well as the process that we were leveraging to um, publish cost in the organization. Um, at, at, at that juncture, we sunsetted our platform and also changed what moved away from relative value units and, and cost to charge. We discovered that cost to charge no longer was applicable to our organization because we shifted to strategic rate setting um, where our cost it was not correlating with our um, pricing structure. On the um, relative value unit side, or what we all know as RVUs, we know that that homogeneity just does not exist across populations. So when you're really talking about care variation, when you're talking about variation in staffing, or even variation in practice, RVUs, do, it doesn't do um, a, the job of really exposing that type of variation. So in 2016, we identified resource-based um, utilization as our um, new costing strategy, and that introduced our journey with Health Catalyst as we moved into um, ABC to use the EMR as our way to derive costs. Great. Um, and then, Dan, I know there was a slide presented uh, in one of the sessions over the past couple of days that you felt was a good way to, to cover this at a high level. Yeah, and our, our perspective was, I, I came and our goal was to use data and provide analytics to uh, our clients. And what we started doing is when we brought cost data in and tried to look at variation, there was almost never variation. And it was really clear that we were also the first people to expose cost data to clinicians and operations folks. And at that point, I, I kind of, started diving into why, and we had some advocates at uh, one of our clients that wanted to do costing a different way. And when you really dive into it, the reason that we never saw any variation is that 
if you're costing based on charges, the only variation is how you charge, not on how many people were seeing the patient, not the intensity, not how much space they utilized, but really just on what you charged. So that was the only variation was how physicians or the billing office charged. And so that's when we decided to, to invest in exploring something different. We said, wow, you know, they've been costing this way because for you know, 30 years ago, charge data was the only thing that's available. Mm -hmm. But in the last decade, EMR data has become widely available with timestamps, check-in, check-out times, volumes, things that could improve costing and the understanding of operations. And so that's where we thought, we already have all this data, we're, we're good at aggregating data, we understand clinical, why can't we apply it to the financial side of the house? And that's what this slide depicts is three patients, same procedure, if you're costing them based on charges, there's no variation because you're assigning that cost to a charge code. On the right, if you start using the activities that actually drive costs, like staff time with the patient, volume to allocate certain things like rent, utilities, et cetera, and then the true supplies and drugs, not just, just based on charge, but looking at order sets, preference cards, et cetera, you see true variation. Um, and I think why that matters is when you're trying to identify variation, you can actually see it. The other is when you roll up different populations, you get vastly different answers from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's interesting with this chart. If you even take away the word patient and replace it with physician, Right, and so if you think about looking at physician variation, because over enough cases, right, a thousand cases, the, the patients start to look much more similar, but the physician practice is where you see tremendous variation. So what's been very useful to us has been, and our physicians actually embrace this. I, I know historically a lot of CFOs who have healthcare backgrounds are married to the RVU just because it's all they've ever known. Um, I'm from outside of the industry, so I had more of a manufacturing bias of understanding resource utilization and resource allocation and variation. And what this does is it allows, and our physicians actually love this and embrace this, it enables physician variation study. And so we can look across 50 orthopods with a high number of cases and really, again, the patients become very similar over that large number and you see tremendous variation in the ABC methodology where you never saw that before in the RVU methodology. So I always say that these things are hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And in an environment now we're all having to cut costs, this is a tool that identifies opportunity as opposed to the traditional, well, everybody across the board, 5% cut. And what you're doing then is you're punishing those that are efficient and effective um, in addition to those that aren't. So why not have a better tool to identify where you have opportunity for efficiency and actually for better quality? Yeah, and it, what I also like about this is from an IT perspective, I know there's some IT people in the audience, so underneath the left side of this is one or two data systems, a billing system and a GL system, whereas on the right, we're starting to actually leverage the data being captured every day in the EMR. Um, and so that's something that's been relatively new over the last five to 10 years. Well, the other thing is, is I think both of you said there's, there's such a wealth of information in the EMR, and I think this was your analogy, which I use I still all the time, is the, the core system is a super collider, right? It's taking the EMR data, which, which is very rich with patient information at a patient and a physician level, mm -hmm. and it, it's taking the general ledger, which is the financial source of truth, and it's smashing them together and the, what, what gets created in a super collider? Subatomic cost particles. Thank Bob. you. <laughs> Subatomic cost particles of information and data and analytics <laughs> are, the, um, are the byproduct of that. And it's just very powerful, very, yeah. very powerful. And so Rob, you're obviously used to this data set. You know, we've been in production there for almost five years, but Migdalia, you're only just first being exposed to this uh, level of detail. Do you agree with that analogy? I um, agree. I mean, we, this has really been the, um, compelling argument that we have shared with our organization. When we talk about value, we're, we're all on a value journey and it's about either exposing value or creating value. And this starts to get at where do we have efficiencies, where do we have opportunity, and how do we actually um, come together and identify countermeasures where those opportunities may exist. 
I think the other thing, uh, we'll never get off this slide. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that's interesting is when, when you're having discussions with physicians and the RVU methodology, to me, that's, that's part of the finance bubble, we call it. The finance team thinks it's the greatest thing ever and they have scores of analytics and the physicians say, I don't recognize that data, I don't acknowledge that data. Under the uh, activity-based costing, our physicians say, okay, I, I understand, yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I use those supplies, I never knew they cost that much, but they recognize the footprint that we present to them from the activity-based costing. So it, again, in, instead of it being a, a push out from finance to operations, this has been more of a pool. Mm -hmm. our, a lot of our service lines and our physicians um, and the administrators have been the, really the evangelists for this. They're like, give, give us more. You know, we want to study, we want to understand where our opportunities are. So to me, that's ultimately the role of the finance team is to enable op operations, not create reports for us to um, self-indulge. Right, and that's, actually, that's a good segue into some of the, the challenges and as it relates to the stakeholders involved with, with taking on an, an initiative like this. Um, there's obviously the change management component. How do you get people on board with, with going along with this? I'll start. I mean, it it's definitely has to be a, a, a top-down initiative. As I said, I think a lot uh, of those with traditional healthcare backgrounds um, just are not used to understanding or embracing the reality of, of cost constraints and resource constraints. And it was interesting if um, not just today's presentation, but I try to remember what we heard this morning about everyone acknowledges volume to value and you know, the triple aim, right? So part of that is cost and quality. So if cost is one of the pillars of the triple aim, how can you have a finance organization or a CFO who's saying, well, what we have is good enough. RVUs are fine. We've had the system for 30 years. Uh, it's going to be a pillar of transformation. Mm -hmm. And so why not create a robust mm -hmm. data set, a financial data set, to support that transition from volume to value? And I think, I think um, Daniel Pink said this morning, it's hard to change somebody's mind. And, but it's easy to, uh, if you make it easy for them to change. And I think, unfortunately, um, we don't have to just rely on changing everyone's mind. That's going to be tough to do. But the core system is relatively easy to implement. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't a, a three-year project. This is a three- to nine-month implementation because, again, you have a general ledger and you have an EMR. So your, your baseline is there. And so it is relatively easy to do. We do have to change some of the hearts and minds as well, the financial people, but again, it's an easy way or an easier way to get very robust data. And if it's a pillar of the strategy change mm -hmm. and the triple aim, how can we not embrace it? Yeah, and I know the triple aim, Migdal, has right. been very critical to what you've been working right. on. Right, the way we've communicated it to our organization and, and really received broad organizational engagement is really anchoring it in value. We don't, we don't really reference our costing tool as a costing tool. We really talk about value analytics and how do we have the outputs of outcome cost as well as um, you know, clinical appropriateness. And understanding those three elements simultaneously is really important as we think about our journey, as we're moving through um, pay varying pay payment models, as we're thinking about care variation, as we're influencing physician preferences. They have to be able to look at the data and understand um, how they're practicing, see their, seeing the episode of a particular patient as they're navigating through our organization. And when those things are not synchronized, as we've talked about in the RVU um, system, there is a level of um, sort of disconnectedness to practice and, 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 and data release. So we have really anchored this in, in how do we think about our value journey, how do we create value, and how do we transform care? And I, I was gonna say, one of the challenges is just legacy finance. I'll, I'll share a story of the first time I worked in a healthcare system. I did, I worked in banking, then I worked in healthcare consulting where we just made reports and handed them to people. Um, then I finally worked in the billing office doing rev cycle consulting. And my second week there, they had an all team meeting with the billing office. And 180 rev cycle uh, billing office folks went into this meeting. We were in the corner in a little office and all of a sudden we heard like a stampede. People were crying and screaming. Someone, we walked outside, someone threw over a file drawer and was like, did everyone get fired? Like we had no idea what happened. And what had happened is they had just reorg from working alphabetically to by payer. So some people had to move cubicles. And it was like the world ended. <laughs> so you think about changing jobs that they've been doing for 20 years, mm -hmm. 
and it's, it's scary, and a lot of people don't want to do it. Um, and, and I think another one of the challenges is there's this misconception that using data from the EMR is m m much more strenuous in terms of maintenance, mm -hmm. when in fact, if you're actually maintaining RVUs, and I, I guess we haven't really talked about what an RVU is, but right. every charge code within each department, they assign a value relatively. And you know, it could be like that, it could be based on a time study, and then they just take all the costs, divide it by those relative value units, and assign it to a charge code. So if you're thinking about the thousands of charge codes, the hundreds of departments, the reason that it's easy to maintain is because they're not maintaining it. They're not doing anything. Right. If you actually were to do those time studies on a regular basis and understand the operations, it would take eons. So they just don't do it. And that's why they say it's easy to maintain. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that we come up with. Oh, it sounds crazy. We need to hire five more people. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, just not the case. Right. Well, and I'm not advocating a mutiny against the CFOs or the finance people, <laughs> but to some extent, there are a lot of data analytics folks here, clinicians here, IT teams, so a, lo a lot of folks that have vested interest in, in the outcomes and the quality. But what I would challenge you to go back and, and talk to your finance folks and your CFO is to say, wait a minute. Um, can we actually do service line financials on a repeatable basis? And again, we're talking days after the close. Can I present service line financials? Many of us have grown through affiliation, so we, we all have a ring of hospitals around our academic core um, with legacy financials and personnel, and we're now trying to rationalize a service line around a geography as opposed to run the traditional um, kind of vertical hospital approach. We want more of the horizontal service line. So how do you actually measure the success, the resource utilization, the efficiency, the clinical outcomes of those service lines? Well, under an RVU methodology or the old systems, you can't do it. So I'd ask those questions. Can you do service line financials on a repeatable basis? Can you do physician variation? Can you, can you put your 20 or your 50 orthopods um, and line them up and evaluate their efficacy from a cost standpoint and a quality and outcomes, length of stay, readmissions? Can you do that on a repeatable basis? And if the answer is no, then that's the start of the mutiny that you don't have what you need in terms of a costing system for this future that's leading to the triple aim or volume to value. I thought you weren't calling for mutiny. Well. <laughs> Let's just say tough questions. That lasted like two yeah. minutes. So we do have to change some minds. We have to change some minds. But, and I, was and I think it, you do it with those questions. I, I would challenge them to ask, can you explain to me how you got this or what I should do with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? With, with anything. And I, I think that's where everything stops because you can't. Yeah. So I think it would be good to go through a specific example. The operating room, for example, has great data. It's one of the better uh, areas of documentation room time in, nurse time in, uh, things like that. So Migdalia, I was going to start with you. So using that as an example, how would you compare uh, your legacy costing system that was based on RVUs in that setting to one that's more detailed? Right, so our new system, we have, to your, rough, to your point, time-based information, staffing mix. We actually know who was in the room operating on the patient, who was part of pre-op, intra-op, and post-op as well as supply use. And so you really get to physician preference. So what is the preferences of our provider and where do we see variation in um, supply utilization? Where do we see variation in just case length? So are there techniques that certain physicians may utilize or prefer because that's how they were trained and how does that impact the duration of a case? Staffing mix, when you start comparing across sites <coughs> to, your point of, um, to, to your point of acquisitions, as we are acquiring practices or acquiring, acquiring other healthcare institutions, how do we have variation in how we staff our various practices? And then just operational inefficiencies. Many of us have high occupancy status, and when we have backups in our ORs, it comes at a cost, and do we understand the cost of that due to delays? So there's a number of um, items that you start to expose, whether it's physician variation, operational variation, um, or just you know practice variation. Yeah, and I think that speaks to another one of Daniel Pink's points about, um, I have my notes here, problem finding versus problem solving. I think the system does a great job at surfacing where you have either documentation issues or true practice variation where you can go. There's a really good um, 
example of this with, with ORs, because we all know ORs are some of the, it's really the, one of the most expensive parts of the hospital, right? And it's, it's the physician costs are a big component of that. Um, there are anesthesiologists, there are CRNAs, there are support staff. And there's really, in, in academic medicine certainly, but I think in other areas where you're not actually looking at the holistic cost of the OR, you're looking at a hospital division, so what's the hospital's cost of the OR, and then you have a physician division, and you have you know, the anesthesia department, let's say. And what happens is many of us have this kind of cross-subsidization. So the hospital agrees to pay the Department of Anesthesiology, let's say, $2 million a year to pay for the costs. So in their budget is a line item, $2 million. It's like, okay, we're on budget, it's $2 million. And in the, in the physician services side, they're saying, oh, we're getting a $2 million payment from the hospital, so we're good. So we create two fixed line items. In reality, what's happening then is you're not measuring the efficiency or the effectiveness. Both sides think they're doing okay. The reality is those costs are fixed. Uh, as volume ebbs and flows, you have no idea how efficient those exam rooms or those anesthesiologists or those CR CRNAs are. You, you actually, it's preventing you from measuring. It's giving you a, a sense of false security. So we started using the, the tool to then prescribe a cost per OR hour. So we basically take the total cost of the facility plus the physician and support costs, and we're simply looking at the capacity in hours per day, and it's highly driven by the, um, I forget the word, the co, um, What's the number of rooms they cover, or the number of surgeries? Uh, so it's basically the anesthesiologist, how many cases they're covering at a time, or are they doing one case? What? Concurrency. Concurrency, thank you. <laughs> um, what, what's the concurrency statistic that they have? That's a, a large driver of the efficiency of the OR. And so when they're very busy in the OR, the efficiency looks fantastic. When they're not busy, mm -hmm. they're literally idle resources. Under the old methodology and the cross-subsidization, everything looks fine. So what it does is it exposes opportunity for efficiency. And if you think about all these facilities that we have, how many ORs do we truly need? Are we utilizing them to the most uh, effective capacity? You can't answer those questions effectively until you can measure resource utilization through activity-based costing. So it allowed us to go and actually <coughs> close um, certain facilities where we had excess capacity. And now that throughput is going to the existing facility. So we're actually able to, to reduce the number. With flat to stable volume, we're actually able to reduce the number of ORs. And it was because of the information we got from the, uh, from the core suite of products. And, and I would add that one thing that I think a lot of people forget is that it's not just about reducing variation. How you grow in population health is more lives under management with the same resources. Right, so it's not necessarily just about reducing variation and mm -hmm. optimizing resources. It's I can take on more lives with the same equipment, capital, buildings, and staff. And I think that's an important thing to remember um, because you're not able to do it by more procedures. You're not able to do it by more visits. It's how can I manage lives efficiently? And then I just want to jump over to the, to the revenue side, so the changing payment models. Rob, you mentioned you're about half capitated. Um, has, has this helped you prepare for that? Or, uh, maybe I'm also curious from your perspective. So we, we are still in a fee-for-service model at Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what we are on the journey of is how do we think about appropriateness, and I'm gonna oversimplify this in the interest of time, but it's really right here, right time, right place, and how do we think about viability? Um, we talk about cost from a payer perspective, but we have to understand our cost structures and say, can it withstand the changing payment models? And what does it mean to adopt an APM? What does it mean to go into a narrow network? What does it mean to be a preferred, preferred provider um, network? All of those things have implications that may actually cause you to close your doors and no longer serve your communities. But in order to understand true profitability and true viability, you have to understand your cost structures. And then you have to go back to appropriateness and say, are you delivering the key in the right place at the right time um, with, you know, with the right person? So those are, we're balancing both appropriateness and, and viability um, simultaneously as we think about our journey to value. I'd like to, we've, we've worked across dozens of clients and the thing that drives me bonkers is a lot of our the prospects, clients, et cetera, will have a pop health group. And the way that they look at the world is, was my PM, PM below the target, right? And did I hit my quality savings? Then you have finance over here looking at 
completely different numbers. How in the world can you not try to see if you actually made money on an at-risk contract by combining what it cost you to deliver the care and the revenue you actually received, both from payments, quality incentives, penalties, shared savings, penalty and savings, and I just don't know how anyone can take on significant risk without understanding the cost structures. And I would love to hear, at some, maybe we can talk afterward, if any of you are doing that or your, uh, your system is doing that, please come talk to me because I'm fascinated by how nobody is. Um, and so I think that's when we talk about, you know, it's not just looking at am I making money on this procedure or bundles, it's am I willing to sign up for this $300 million at-risk contract, do I know if I'm actually making or losing money on it? Great. Um, and then, Robin McDowell, if you could just share, from your perspective, why do you think that more health systems haven't made the, this, this journey? Well, I think, go ahead, go ahead please. <laughs> well, I, you said it takes six, three to six months. It hasn't taken Michigan three to six months to <laughs> deploy Chorus. So um, it is, I, for, for Michigan, because of the approach we've taken, it is a longer um, journey, and it's an upfront investment, and it's a prioritization. Are we going to prioritize it across disciplines? So is IT engaged? Do you have clinical engagement? Do you have finance engagement? And do you have operational engagement? And you need all four areas to engage in this work truly for it to be successful because you have to get frontline buy-in as well as executive um, sponsorship. And so in the absence of those two things, you will not move forward to your point. There should not be a mutiny against finance leaders. I was a former finance leader, but I think there is a need for finance to recognize that costing is not um, any longer housed in finance. I, drew, I truly do believe that there is an operational element to costing, and there is this integration of costing in order to truly discover value. Well, I think we also, um, we don't want to let um, perfect get in the way of good, good enough. And um, that is something to keep in mind with make, not making it overly complex. The, there's so much variation, there's so much opportunity that, that there's a risk in trying to make it perfect. Good enough is fine. It will, and, and my litmus test is the physicians. If the physicians um, buy in and believe in the data, then we've accomplished our goal. We, we can always refine things over time, but this gives us a baseline of, of areas to go and, and to seek to reduce the variation. And so it is incredible to me what we've learned, the amount and level of variation that we have. The nursing variation, um, and again, this is not an overnight success or all the answers come. This is going to be years of us digesting this information. So we have incredible nursing cost variation. So we look at nursing cost per patient day. And we, you know, we try to divide it by large, large units, medium-sized units, smaller units, because there are differences. But once you try to come to some level of standardization and you start comparing one against another, it's really hard to explain why one acts in a certain way and why one acts in a different way. Then you add the quality data on. And that's the powerful thing. Again, once we start, we're starting this now, we've had a different approach than many of the other Health Catalyst clients who started with the EDW and the clinical information first and now we're implementing the cost data. We implemented Chorus, the cost data first, and now we're integrating the quality data. And I know our quality folks, uh, our analytics team, are just um, so energized and excited because I think we're going to get there where we're really starting to, to see both these things up against one another and, and make those value decisions around what is the cost of quality, what are the, the balances between quality and cost. And um, it's just, it, it's such a, uh, a bountiful amount of information available to us to go it again and, and become more efficient and optimize what we do. And it was, we, we had no idea before. We, did, we couldn't see it, it was hiding in plain sight. Thanks. So before we get into more of the results and a couple more questions, I just want to uh, send us over to the last poll question here. Just as a reminder to submit your answers in the HAZ app, uh, and this is again session number 13. On a scale of one to five, as U.S. healthcare moves to new payment models, how prepared is your organization in understanding their costs and profitability across service lines? Looks about right. Yeah, so at least somewhat. <laughs> Rob McDowell, any reactions to that? 
I, uh, you know, I think, I think we kind of knew this, right? So more than half are um, not very well prepared for, for what is ahead. And uh, we, we've, we've heard it today, we've heard it other times. The, the federal government, the state governments are running out of funding. Um, we heard from one of the speakers in, in the pre-session yesterday that the feds are, are looking strictly at Medicare and Medicaid to balance the budget in coming years. The deficit is, it is a record amount. So the government programs are gonna be under siege. We already know that the businesses are questioning the cost of healthcare, they're going direct. We know that the digital disruptors and the insurers, they're insourcing healthcare. They're attacking our outpatient book of business. So the, the party will be over eventually and I think you know this is part of the struggle. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. We're going to wake up, and, and things won't be fine. And the question is, are you making those preparations now to be ready in five years for the future that is going to be coming to us? And and I think you know you still have time, but not much time. And I and I just want to pu just pull from Daniel Pink's statement on information asymmetry. And I really, when we talk about costing and activity-based costing, it's moving to parity. How do we really distribute costs, move out of data silos, and start to think about how we merge clinical data with finance data, with operational data to better inform clinical practice, to inform patient outcomes, and to inform the cost to our systems. Payer cost is still the revenue streams to healthcare systems. As those are cut, we will compromise our margin. So it's a delicate balance, and it's hard to, to move your cost structure. Bending the cost curve takes time, and it, it takes information. And it's how we organize the information, but more importantly, how we create the right engagement platform in order to um, problem solve through it. Gotcha. So we just have a couple more minutes before Q&A. Um, we've covered many of these lessons here today. There's one that I want to double click on, just final thoughts here. But the consistent approach across all entities, one thing Ann Milgram was saying at a macro level was this, this siloed mentality of, you know, healthcare data versus um, criminal justice data. Do you see it on a micro level? As, uh, it's, it's one thing I, I can remember uh, as we implemented just the challenges with the, getting the data in, integrated uh, and validated. Well, I think, um, and again, we heard it this morning, again, just tremendous variation with physician practice. Mm -hmm. um, are we really moving from the art of medicine to the science of medicine, you know, with, with data, with big sets of data where we can look at it and predict over time? Um, it, it's, it's just, it's a very, very large opportunity and the tools that have always been in place are not adequate to identify that to get us to where we need to be. So it starts out as a, as a financial process. We're talking about cost accounting, but I think it really gets back to this is the, the finance team stewardship and, and assistance with the clinical teams to help them make the right decision. It may not always be about lowering the cost. It may be about raising the cost in the right instance, but it's that where's the balance between the quality and the cost so that we're doing the right things and maximizing the outcomes. And again, if you don't have cost and quality, you can't make the right decision, right? If you only have one or the other, you, you very well could make the wrong decision. So I use the example of the nursing units. So the most costly nursing units, they may be our best. We haven't put that together yet to see outcomes with cost, but it'll be great when we can to say, wait a minute, you know, this is the right model for the nursing, the staffing, the skill mix, and so we need to do this everywhere. It's, it may be more costly, but again, it's gonna be the right decision. And without these more advanced tools, it's hard to make those kind of decisions. And they're very important decisions. Any final thoughts, McDowell? I mean, definitely having a platform that serves as a data integrator is critical. So breaking down data silos requires that you have a repository system. And so thinking about where that repository lies, as you're aware at Michigan, we have probably consumed maybe 16 to 20 various applications into the data warehouse to drive our cost models. And so working with all the data stores across all the data silos and bringing them together, getting buy-in on why we need access to your data because there is that perception that this is my data and I'm not sharing, hence why we continue to see information asymmetry. Um, once we have that ability to data integrate, we're able to start to inform on truly how we're seeing patients navigate our systems and how resource consumption looks um, across practices. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much for that informational session. We have some questions for you. 
Um, so you just got a cost-based accounting system. Now what? What low-hanging fruit do you go after? So at, at Michigan, we will, um, we will start with physician variation, um, specifically supply variation. Some of the things that we're looking at from a nursing perspective is what we're calling um, low value care. Because we're bringing in flow sheet data into our costing models, we're able to understand how interventions and assessments are occurring across populations and when do we see um, variation or divergence from what is sitting in the um, mean for that population. So there is some work in front of us on where we have opportunity and low value care as well as um, supply utilization. I think for us it's really three things that uh, where we focus. The first one is at an executive level, we've created really some executive level statistics. So we are measuring and we have monthly visibility to the CEO, to uh, the entire executive team and the hospital management executives, um, a suite of measurements. Uh, we have two years of trend data, so we're looking at trends over time. So we're looking at things like cost per OR hour, um, nursing cost per patient day, um, supply cost per adjusted patient discharge, CMI adjusted patient discharge. So executive suite level metrics. So from a, a high level standpoint, um, where are we headed as an organization? Are we being cost productive or not? Um, the physician variation has been very popular and it's been consumed and embraced by our physicians. And then service line analytics. It, it's really created the capability for us to begin to measure service lines and to start to rationalize service lines. And then uh, the other great byproduct of that was, was around supply costs. Because we're measuring the service lines, not just the old silo, the physician division versus the hospital division, supply costs accrued, lowering supply costs accrued to the hospital division, but the physicians made the, the decisions and had to make the choices. And they weren't really motivated or incented to make tough decisions because they didn't get credit. The hospital got credit. Using service line financials and budgeting, the physicians now get credit for service line for supply cost reduction. So they've been much more cooperative. And so when faced with budget cuts, would you rather cut a million dollars? Would you rather cut staff? Or would you rather go from five suppliers to four or standardize around a platform? So it's really energized our supply cost savings because the physician engagement, they now have a real incentive, a financial incentive. Um, to engage and to make tough decisions around supply selections. And, and I just add, it, it also, again, goes back to that problem finding of it's not going to be perfect when you, when you implement activity-based costing the first time, but it's going to show you where you have data quality issues, where you want to prioritize with your organization, you know, which ones to tackle first. What can an analytics team do while waiting for the CFO to come in line to this thought process? Doing an Excel. I would love someone <laughs> to tell me that. Uh, I, I think I've literally been asked this five times in the last 24 hours by physicians or analytics folks. I, I think, the, again, the number one case is showing that you want to engage and you want to use the data and why what you have today is insufficient. Um, and then hire someone like Rob or McDalia to lead finance and be the hammer to uh, drive change. But uh, there, is, there isn't an easy answer. We're, you know, we're talking about every silo across the organization, massive change management, huge processes, additional technology. Um, but I think that where we've seen it is showing finance that you care about it and why what you have isn't working. Because there's been a wall between analytics and finance. Right. Finance thinks everything's great. Everyone else has just not used what finance produces. And so I think showing that you care um, and calling out the weaknesses is a good start. I think that's a really important point. When I started this work, I was the director um, for analytics at Michigan um, in finance. And really bringing, fi and I had to bring finance along. <laughs> that did not happen overnight. It was really um, demonstrating where we were in current state. Um, showing where there was true variation in what we reported and what was what the actual cost um, was. We pulled data from supply chain, so we actually did do some deep dives and took some time 
to say, well, we're reporting pharmacy cost of X in our EPSI tool, and when we go into Willow, it's actually saying Y, and when we go into um, our supply chain data, it's, it's still saying Y. And so we did a lot of those types of gut checks just to demonstrate that there was true um, variation, and just pure misreporting and misleading data that we were distributing to the organization. The other compelling argument is when you start to look at profitability. So are you actually communicating that a service line is profitable or not? And to the point of rationalizing on particular service lines, you may miscommunicate whether something's not profitable or something is, is extremely profitable. So there's opportunity to think about how you bring your teams together to deep dive into your data sets and to do comparisons with um, other data sets that actually shows ac acquisition cost. I would start with supplies, though. It's easier. Yeah. So I'd say, um, trying to pick my words correctly, a controlled mutiny would be <laughs> the suggestion. Um, and in the long game, so are we playing for the long game? What's our, what's our five-year strategy to actually move to the triple aim, and how are we going to do it? What's the foundation of that? And it's got to be robust and, and accurate cost information. And, um, and asking those tough questions, how are we doing service line uh, financials today? Is it repeatable and systemic? How are we analyzing physician variation today? Mm -hmm. And if your finance team can't answer that and your physicians don't support that, then I think you're making the case for, for Chorus. And again, the ROI on this, uh, I will tell you, is exponential because it, it is revealing to us years and years of cost reduction opportunities by making this investment in, in a, a robust suite of data analytics around cost. <laughs> I want to tag on one thing on the ROI. For whatever reason, if you go talk about revenue cycle, people will sneeze and give you a million dollars to go hire consultants or buy tools. But if you talk about investing in cost or cost management analytics, it's like, oh, whoa, 50 bucks? Like, I, <laughs> juice, juice isn't worth the squeeze. Even though most health systems cost structure is 98% of what the revenue is. And so it's just this thing that I haven't, I mean, other than everyone hates reducing cost and everyone loves more money, uh, more revenue. Uh, but I think just making sure that we're level setting on the, the realities of how much cost opportunity that there is and how little has been invested to date. Great. Okay, what is your recommendation for quality improvement teams that use, want to use cost accounting as part of their key process analysis? Can you repeat the question? What is your recommendation for quality improvement teams that want to use cost accounting as part of their key process analysis? I, I think we, we've kind of covered that question. Uh, I know with our team, they're, you know, we're measuring so many things, we're reporting on so many quality measures, but I don't know that to make the case for quality, uh, it's very powerful to prescribe cost to that lack of quality. So right, what is the cost of readmissions? What is the cost of hacky? And so when you do that, what you're doing is you're giving them, you know, yes, we know it's the right thing to do to have better quality. When you can start to dollarize that, it makes a case that everybody, I think, starts to listen to and, um, and, and puts a different um, view towards the, the, what it's really costing a health system by having poor quality. So again, it's another way for this not to be done in a finance bubble, but again, the clinicians driving it and then having the, the quality improvement and the quality teams driving it as well, um, the, the financial information is very relevant to them to make their case. Right, so when we initiated on this work, we actually started with our quality partners um, to engage on our costing journey, and I think that was really important because we were thinking about outcomes data while also thinking about how physicians think about their episodes um, and then bringing in the financial elements. So that partnership between finance and quality will be critical as they're understanding how to interpret the financial information and how the financial inf information integrates with how they may choose to stratify their patient populations and then how the outcome information informs um, cost, because cost is yet another outcome measure. I'll, I'll take a, a little different twist, but I, I look at it as, Quality is really hard, right? Getting quality metrics across the entire health system is hard, but there are certain things that are easy, like patient safety events. Don't give someone sepsis, right? What are the cost of those pa preventable patient safety events 
that you can really focus on because there's not a lot of data around there what the true cost is. Um, and so I think highlighting those, the low hanging fruit that's very preventable and controllable is a great way to start engaging quality as opposed to trying to build a robust quality measurement, you know, cost per quality outcome for a whole system. So I think being pragmatic in identifying the, the low hanging fruit, the controllable stuff, the high, the high cost stuff is, is a great way to engage initially. Great. We probably have time for one more question or maybe two, depending on the answers. Um, Rob, this question is specifically for you. The physician cost variation reporting, is it transparent or blinded with their peers? Um, when I see it, it's blinded, but I'm not sure. Um, we have my women's health team. Do you guys reveal the names? You do? Uh Okay, so um, we started out with, you know, the physician would know who they were. So if it was like A through Z, you know, the physician would know I'm physician E, so I can see where I am compared to everyone else. But now, as you heard, our women's health is now revealing the names to everyone. And we know physicians are quite competitive, and um, they want to understand, you know, where they are and why and what they can do to improve it. So um, that level of transparency, again, has led to what I'll say, again, self uh, you know, they're, they're self-opting to improve. And, and a lot of times they didn't know the cost of the implant they were using. They're like, look, I'll make the change. I didn't know, I don't care if I use this one or that one. I didn't know that this cost twice as much. So again, it's informing them. They recognize the data. So they, when they see their profile, they'll say, yes, that's me. I know I use that. And under the old RVU-based methods, they're sort of like, again, it's a finance bubble because the physicians say, that doesn't do me any good. Everybody looks the same. And that's not, those aren't my results, your data's wrong. Much more buy-in on the data, they recognize who they are, and so they want to improve, they want to do better. So we're reducing that variation, and that's a lot easier to do than it is to say five across, 5%, five percent, two percent across the board. Magdalia, do you reveal? During our, we are in a soft launch, we are currently blinded. A lot of discussion as to when we will unblind. <laughs> and we've, we've seen, in, right, it's a maturity model too. You don't want to just blast it out there and you know, spank everybody right off the bat. <laughs> but, but we've seen different approaches where some will only show direct costs. Some will only show supply costs and then process metrics, right? Not even caring about the labor cost per minute. It's, are you in the OR? 50 minutes longer than everyone else. We know that drives labor costs. So there are different yeah. approaches. And, and those are important, right? The, the OR time would have been unrecognized before. Yep. The length of stay would have been unrecognized if you only look at direct materials, direct supplies. And so you want a holistic approach. So if somebody has a longer length of stay, that's a cost to the health system. If they have longer OR time, that's a, a use of resources. And it has to be part of that activity-based costing model. So it's, it's, it's informative. This, I mean, this is why the change management component of this is so critical and how you create your engagement platform. If it's a punitive platform, you will find a lot of organizational resistance. So using it as a way to discover, but also as a way to um, problem solve is going to be um, critical in order to um, gain physician buy-in, but also frontline staff. Great. Well, let's please give a round of applause to Bob, Magdalia, Rob, and Bob. Dan. Yeah.